right, good evening, everybody. Uh, we will go ahead and get started out of respect for everybody's time. It is 7.01 and we had a seven o'clock start time, so we'll get rolling. Uh, we wanna thank everybody for attending tonight's uh, swimming and diving officials training. This will be done in kind of three parts. The first part will be uh, meet referee information, roles and responsibilities, and then we'll have diving official uh, meet referee, I mean, I'm sorry, diving official roles and responsibilities, and then we will have stroke and turn judge roles and responsibilities. So it'll be divided into three parts. And certainly as we go along, if you've got questions for the presenters, it'll be Jeff and Pete will start us off and then it'll be Jim and then it'll be Pam. If you've got questions, you can put them in the chat and I will do my best to monitor that chat box and interrupt the presenters at a time that uh, makes sense. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our first presenters for the evening, which will be Jeff Cotter and Pete Denevan. And Pete, I think uh, I think this is you first uh, about the roles and responsibility of the of the meet referee. Uh, I was going to kind of cover just a little bit more on the rules changes for. Uh, this is upcoming season. I know we covered most of it uh, last night in the meeting, uh, and I don't think there's a, a big need to rehash everything too in depth, um, but we can go through uh, that. Um, Dana, I don't know if you have those slides from last night that had the rule changes on them, but I think these slides right here are for Pete to present. So. I'll let him take it away. When do you want to do your portion, Jeff? Just so I know when. Uh, when, yeah, uh, when Pete's you. done. When Pete's done with his part. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, then uh, Pete, we'll go ahead and get you started, sir. So, uh, meet referee roles and responsibilities. Okay, Dana. Oh, good. And basically, these are covered within the NFHS swimming and diving book. Uh, the pre-meet responsibilities arrive early. Verify the water conditions, temperature and clarity. Verify the uh, facility setup. Make certain the backstroke flags are properly set. Uh, check the, uh, the lane lines. Basically a whole lot of safety type of items and also associated with the scoring. Meet the administrative staff. Uh, you know, those would be the people operating the console and the timers. One of the first things to do is to introduce yourself to the meet director, who typically is the uh, coach of the host team. Then you go into the officials meeting where you would assign the responsibilities and talk about anything that may have come up. Uh, in previous meets. We, what we would do is hold a briefing, uh, talk about some of the roles and responsibilities. I know I actually have a template that I use for each one of these officials meetings to make certain that I cover everything. I update it every year to include the points of emphasis and any situations that have come up in the previous meets. Then you hold the coaches and captains meeting. I always like to have the captains there just so they can help their coaches enforce the rule. I also make a pitch for them becoming the officials. Typically we'll have it at the hospitality room and point out to the captains that once they become officials, they're welcome to join us at the hospitality room. Uh, also during this time, I'll sit down, rest my legs and watch the, uh, the warmups. I'll watch for any uh, suit violations, any coverage violations. And it's a good way to attune my eyes to the during the one-way starts that the um you know kind of adjust by eyesight uh also make certain that the warm-up rules are enforced three-point entry and things like that 
And that's a good way to check the stability of the starting blocks that during the one way starts, if uh, you are able to watch the starting blocks and they don't wobble and they're firmly set, uh, you will be in good shape. Again, a safety item. If anybody has any questions during these pre-meet responsibilities or any of the others, uh, please speak up or to, uh, otherwise uh, uh, let me know what questions you might have. Dana? The responsibilities during the meet are to conduct the meet in accordance with the NFHS and as applicable, the NMAA rules. I always like to get a copy of the meet invite in order to ensure that I'm familiar with what's in there, familiar with the warm up times, and uh, generally would know what teams are, um, are uh, participating. Obviously, one of the, the key things for a referee, for any referee, is to adjudicate and record the disqualifications. Various uh, facilities. Uh, do this differently. I use a DQ log. I record the violation, who made the call. I'll make certain that the coach and swimmer are notified and pass that to the, uh, to the administrative desk for them to use. And then at the uh, conclusion of the meet, use this DQ log as the verification of the uh, of of the meet results. During the course of the meet, one of the key things is to determine if there's a need to use backup times. I will stay in contact with the um, administrative desk to make certain they're getting the times right. The backup times and if we're using watches, the watch time. Uh, it would be during this period that I would actually perhaps pause the meet or perhaps have to, uh, to go back and do some consultation to make certain that the swimmer gets the proper time. For the timers, I'll walk up and down and if the backup times aren't within the three tenths of a second, I'll talk with the head timer to have him remind the timers to, to pay attention. Uh, you know, timing is a critical thing and you only get one correct time. Again, the reference in the NFHS book, uh, for the larger meets, it'd be an experienced person like Jeff, myself, or many of the others who are on this seminar this evening. However, for some of the small dual meets, it might be one of, uh, one of the lesser experienced people, but that gives you the opportunity to develop and advance. Any questions? The post-meet responsibilities, check the scores tabulations. You should be presented with a printout associated with that. That's the uh, one that I use to check against my DQ log. Hopefully that the times have already been adjudicated and that the times are correct even though I will just glance at those to, to make certain that nothing seems out of place. You know, like a, a Olympic qualifying time or something like that. I initial each page of the meet results, something that I learned to do in, when I was overseas and then at the end, we'll sign it and date it and time it. And then that is submitted to NMAA by the meet director, who not only submits the high tech results, but also the written results to Jackie Martinez. She keeps a log of these 
and I would encourage all beat directors to, to check that log to make certain that they've been properly uh, recorded. That's a very brief summary of some of the many uh, responsibilities of the uh, referee, the meet referee. Uh, I can tell you, I keep learning things and I've been doing this for about 25 or 30 years. And I try to, to do it right. Sometimes I get messed up like we all do as officials, but you have to put that behind you and continue. Any questions about the meet referee? Or Jeff, is there anything you want to expand on? Um, thanks, Pete. Uh, this is uh, Jeff Cotter. And uh, I think Jim brought up a good point in the, uh, in the uh, chat just a little while ago that uh, based on the information that was uh, as shared with us last night, if you're functioning as a meet referee during this uh, upcoming season, you have the added responsibility of making sure that uh, everyone in the meet and the facility is operating under their uh, COVID-19 protocols. So that's an added responsibility of the meet referee to making sure that all those protocols are in place and, and being and being followed. And that would be done in conjunction with not only the meet director, but also the facility manager, the actual manager, the natatorium or the venue that you were using. But Jeff, that's a very correct uh, thing. I'm not too certain if there are any of those that directly apply only to us officials and Dana, I know there was one thing in the guidelines that you circulated earlier about preventing any overnight travel. Does that apply only to the teens or does that also apply to the officials? It really only applies to the teams that we've been told at this point. Obviously everything changes, but um, it's really to keep kids from having to travel together on a bus and then stay together in hotel rooms and all of that stuff. Whereas with with officials as adults, you probably aren't having to share a bed with each other. So I, I think <laughs> a, I think it was more of an overnight issue for the teams. Okay, thank you. Of course. Yeah. I'll add uh, to, uh, you know, I read it. It's somewhat like the swimsuit logo and what used to be jewelry while you're on the deck. Uh, you, the coaches are going to be too tied up preparing their swimmers or their events or their time. So we're the extra set of eyes, I think, to uh, point out areas that uh, may be uh, non-COVID guideline related to the actual contestant or, or bring and, it to the coach's attention. And, and that's right, Jim. If I or anybody else observes something, always bring it to the coach's attention uh, try to remember the swimmer and what the particular swimmer was wearing to help the coach identify that uh, athlete and be able to correct the situation. Okay, do we have any more comments about that? But I think as a, a, a meet referee or a, a a diving official that's responsible for running the diving portion of a meet. You're going to have to take the extra steps to coordinate with the meet uh, host, the host of the meet and the facility uh, manager to make sure that uh, during the time of COVID, um, all the, their uh, protocols are uh, being followed. So. I think that's all we need. I don't know if we, I don't think we need to say anything else about that, but that's just one more thing that we need to be aware of uh, for any uh, upcoming meets. Dana, one question. Will these athletes have COVID tests that they have to pass before the meet or is there anything like that? 
No, uh, there isn't a requirement at this point for athletes to be COVID tested. I know that they're all being recommended that they do the, you know, the temperature checks and all of that stuff. Um, some school districts may have different mandates, but it's nothing that's come down from our office. Okay. Okay, Dina, did, um, do you have, can you share the, the rule slides from last night? I think I have them. Uh, let's see if I am able to make my computer explode. Um, hold on just a second. Was it the, I think I found it. Let's see. I found it. It has oh. like the N NFHS logos and the headers and stuff. I believe I've got it. Let me try to share this guy. Does that look right? That's it. All right. Look at that. Well, um, I think uh, more than a few people on this call tonight were uh, on the call last night, and and we did go through these. But uh, um, I'll so I'll just uh, we won't take a real a real long time going through these again. And I think if there's any questions, you can pop those on to, into the chat and we can talk about them uh, um, later. Um, and I think I'll go through this like we did last night with Jim taking the diving portion and I'll take and I'll take the swimming portion. So um, there's uh, really only a couple of what's considered uh, rule changes for on the swimming side of things. Uh, it's more of a, a clarification, I, I guess, but uh, this first rule change in section 1-1-1 is talking about the, the end wall of the pool. And uh, I'll just read it straight out of the rules. It's the end wall is the vertical portion of the pool contiguous surface of the deck and the overflow gutter, the front of the starting block or platform or the touch pad at the end of the course. So it's not, uh, so the swimmer when they're making a turn or completing a race, they have to make contact with that portion of the wall for it to be a legal turn or finish. And on the next slide, it shows, it's a pretty good picture of what we're talking about, which is not considered the part of the end wall is that gutter area, kind of in that dark shady area there. Uh, that is not considered a portion of the end wall to actually make the legal contact during the turn or finish, they would have to contact, the swimmer would have to contact the, the wall beneath the gutter where the uh, the black, you know, crosses or that uh, platform of the deck where it's, I don't know, four or six inches wide, that is considered part of the end wall, but not, but not the gutter in the shaded area. So next slide. Um, Jim. Yeah, thank you. I'm Jim Wyrock. Uh, glad to be a part of this uh, session. Uh, for the first time, and it's good to have our diving officials uh, that I see on here here as well. Um, anywhere uh, last night, I was just thinking of that end wall and how it would affect the diving portion of the event. And I don't think hitting either one is going to be a successful finish uh, to a dive, but hopefully we'll never have to apply that uh, rule. Um, these uh, diving, they call them real changes. It's hard to even uh, since the change, but uh, it's more of uh, wordsmithing how they want it described in a round of dives is one dive by each participant. Uh, that's pretty uh, easily to understand. And the session really refers to championship meets uh, in which uh, there's 11 dives. There's certain types of dives that have to be that are specified in the rule books that are done in the first five, which is a dive session. Um, well, I guess there's even could be three if we had more than 32 divers, but rarely do. Um, so uh, there's a preliminary, that's really a session, that's five dives. 
the next session is considered the semifinals and the final session is the final. So they like they're inserting the word session into the uh, rule book. That's a photo of me over there on the right. Oh, not on this. No, just half of me. I had a mask on just to let you know. Um, <laughs> an old photo. Next one is uh, uh, practice dives. And this is one, and Pete uh, brought this up. It was, it was last year, maybe the time before. Um, and there's some wording to this um, that changes the, the current wording. And, and the current wording still in there in that uh, divers, uh, if the diving event is held after the 50 free, which is kind of rare um, nowadays in most regular season meets. And because uh, the diving would be usually will happen the day before, uh, just for timing purposes, and maybe even more so this year than others, uh, because of capacity issues of a facility. I had a follow up conversation last night with Jack and this today with Jack and, and uh, Sally about this. But with this particular rule, um, you we rarely have uh, warm ups prior to each session, meaning a championship meet. Many times they're allowed to open up the diving boards again, work on those next few dives, and then start the meet. Um, uh, you can specify that if you're going to have that, but it's not required. But what does come up, um, and Pete ran across it, was that there was, um, if there's no warm up for divers prior to the meet, uh, and they're allowing the warm up session to be right before the diving, then the rule in the rule book doesn't necessarily apply very well. It's a it's one front takeoff and one back takeoff and you're ready to go. Uh, I think that rule assumes they've had a warm up prior to the meet and then there there's a period of time where the meet has run where they are um, not able to access it. So. Uh, suffice it to say, if there's not a warm-up period prior to the meet for the divers, then the official, diving official should allow adequate time uh, and a little extra time, more so than a, a two bounces of the board, which is somewhat specific in the book, uh, rule book. And then uh, here's, it goes back to my earlier statement of how they break out diving, uh, particularly in championship meets. Uh, with contestants up to 32 contestants. And we rarely now, after adjusting the uh, degree of difficulty criteria for qualifying, uh, won't get into the 30s where we usually get 20, 22 divers maybe to qualify for a state championship meet. So that's that, those points. Uh, the next one, I can't control the page, but that might be Jeff's. Or did we lose Dana? Uh, no, let's see. I think that's still you, Jim. Here. Oh, there it is. <laughs> oh, that is me. Um, <laughs> I was like, what did I do? <laughs> I, I, was, I was done with that one. Um, pretty self-explanatory, but the just to let people know how it works. If there's over 16 divers, that's usually what they place at state uh, meet, but it, it is dependent upon the number of scoring places. But um, at state, the, uh, the finals is considered 16 divers. Uh, but to get there, if you have more than 20, um, you will cut down to uh, 20 after five dives, and then you'll cut down to 16 after eight dives so that those final three dives considered the finals session um, will be all uh, places that will score points. That's what, nothing really has changed, just some verbiage. That's that. Okay, and uh, we talked a little bit about this one last night as well. Um, this is, again, considered a rule change, but uh, 
more of a point of clarification stating that the USA Swimming uh, checkmark logo or the FINA uh, approval logo on a uh, swimsuit for competition is not considered uh, to be uh, additional uh, logo that would not be allowed on the uh, swimsuit in accordance with uh, NFHS uh, swim, swimsuit and cap uh, rules. So um, that, that's uh, a rule change for, for this year. And that is a graphic of what those uh, logos look like. So the USA swimming the check mark uh, of approval on the left and the, the FINA barcode um, scan block on the, on the right. Those are not considered an, 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 uh, an additional logo on a suit and are uh, legal. Um, okay, this is a rule change talking about uh, timing and judging. Uh, the official time is always in, in, in facilities where they actually have a timing system that is operable it is the touchpad with the button or the pickle as the secondary uh, time timing mechanism and then the stopwatch as the, the third, the tertiary uh, uh, or third uh, or third type of uh, timing device, um, and if there's a malfunction of the touchpad or the or the pickle or the button, then the stopwatch uh, comes into play using the three tenths of a second rule, and uh, the order of finish is determined by integration of uh, of uh, the yeah, official times for for those lanes, so that's really nothing new to uh, uh, swimming officials. We're we're used to dealing uh, with uh, time integrations from touch pads and and pickles and stopwatches, and in the case in in cases at the city of Albuquerque pools. Um, and for example, at West Mesa, during the previous years in competition, um, and there's two meets going on simultaneously, we're always just using the, the watch times. Um, I don't know how that will work uh, this year. I kind of believe that they won't allow two, two meets to go on at once based on the number of uh, competitors competitors that like the total capacity of a facility or an event will be a hundred people. So I don't uh, see uh, us having two meets at, going on at once at West Mesa, but we do conduct meets at uh, Highland pool sometimes and that's strictly with uh, stopwatches. Next one, Dina. Um, this is just, uh, not, again, not really a rule change, just saying that the, the backup system um, for all races shall be operable. Um, and that will be the time which is used if the uh, uh, primary uh, touchpad is not, uh, that time is not recorded properly. So you have uh, the touchpad, like I said before, the pickle or the button, and then, then the stopwatches. And you uh, can garner an official time from those backup systems if the uh, primary timing system does not work properly. Back to Jim. Yep, uh, this is, uh, let's see. Um, I thought about this one a little more um, and there's two part for championship meets uh, there there's two particular parts one the diver must be entered with the entries uh, based on 
whatever was predetermined as the deadlines for uh, coaches to get in their, their uh, meet entries. Uh, it says championship meets. There are time. What, what worried me a little bit is that <laughs> some coaches forget to enter their divers uh, many times um, and into a meet and we, we are kind of deck entering them. That's usually never in a championship meet. Um, they're already always entered. Uh, so I'm not as worried, but I did remind the coaches last night and we'll continue because it helps have a load all those entry names into the system so that when I do provide them the results, they have it all there. So um, getting the diver individual name in, particularly in championship meets in this rule is a part of their entering the contest. And then the next slide uh, speaks to um, uh, the two-part entry, meaning they had to submit a score sheet that's uh, filled out completely um, with everything filled in and signed by them and their coach. That may not be on this one, but it's on another one of the rules. Um, and the specifics behind circling voluntary dives uh, so that the officials that help, particularly at championship meets, um, can quickly determine uh, which are volunteer and which are optional dives. That's that. Jeff, I think you're on mute. Yep, I'm on mute, thanks. Um, so these are editorial changes. This one has to do with timers. Um, and this is uh, sort of new to me, uh, but uh, the, the editorial change, uh, you can see they struck out or touchpad if automatic judging equipment is used. Um, so the, a head timer shall determine the, if a swimmer has touched the finished end and for the 500 uh, freestyle or the 400 meter freestyle, which uh, we don't have here in New Mexico, we have the 500 free, shall keep a written tally of the number of laps completed by the swimmer in that lane. Um, that is typically done by the, the starter and uh, they're keeping the tally of the number of laps completed and the starter is also keeping the order of finish. So I don't believe that there's uh, really any uh, changes there. That's something that uh, as US, those of us that are USA swimming officials are used to doing, uh, keeping order of finish and uh, keeping count of the laps completed during a race. So um, I don't think that's, anything new to most of us. And these are, uh, these are new illustrations that uh, came out this year in the NFHS uh, rule book um, for forward and backstroke starts, uh, new, uh, new illustrations of the hand signals. And we occasionally have a meet where there's a disabled swimmer or Swimmers that have uh, difficulty hearing, they can't, they're uh, unable to hear the, the start. And so we use the hand signals. So if you're a starter, um, you should be familiar with these hand signals and uh, be ready to uh, implement them at a meet should you have a swimmer that uh, needs to have uh, hand signals for a forward or, or backward start. And these are these are in the rule book uh, from this uh, year. So if you need to study up on those, um, they're available. But this is just uh, this is just saying that there's new illustrations of these hand signals. And the next slide, this is the forward start. The next slide is the, the backstroke start.
And you can go to the next one, Dina. Points of emphasis. Uh, again, uh, this is just stating that the, the referee at the meet should establish a line of communication with the timing system operator and the operator of the meet management software, something that we're all used to doing. Um, and then talking with the folks that are helping you run the meet, uh, head timer, you know, meeting with your start, your head timer, the, uh, the, the uh, operator of the timing system and talking about responsibility, starter keeping order of finishes, um, what the rules are for uh, discrepancies between the touchpad and backup times, uh, entry limits and that kind of stuff. We're, we're pretty uh, comfortable with establishing those uh, line of communications with uh, those helping the meet referee actually run the meet. Uh, Jeff, one thing yeah. that I, I forgot to mention is during the coaches and captains meetings, I also asked for documentation associated with any medical conditions and whether or not there are any disabilities such as you just pointed out to declare or a swimmer who might not feel comfortable uh, using the starting blocks and might want to enter from the water. So that's something that the meet referee should be aware of before the meet start. That, that's a good point. And um, that, yeah, that's, a, that's the right time to bring that up is during the, the, the captain's meeting or the, the pre-meet meeting with the, the coaches. So that, that's a good reminder. Uh, th thank you, uh, Pete, for that. Um, and then this is a point of emphasis, uh, talking about the establishing of an official time. Um, we kind of touched on this earlier. Touchpad is the primary time. If that's, uh, if you have a malfunction of the touchpad, then you go to your backup uh, times, uh, the pickle or the button and the, and the stopwatches uh, from whatever uh, lean that needs to have the back uh, backup times integrated to uh, establish uh, an official time. Um, so again, something that uh, as meet officials, we're all pretty uh, familiar with. Uh, this just went back to reiterate uh, the two-step process for entry into a championship meet, uh, being entered through the system and then uh, submitting the, a proper and fully completed uh, score sheet uh, to begin the con uh, contest. And yeah. again, this is back to swimming and the and the hand signals. Uh, like Pete mentioned, uh, uh, it's uh, good to be aware of what swimmers on what teams may uh, need to have the hand signals utilized. So if we, as, a, as a referee or an, it, really any type of official, you can you know, be made aware of that prior to the meet, then uh, that helps uh, move things along because you know uh, what event, what heat, and what swimmer may need to have those accommodations uh, made for them. Um, and I, I don't really have any more to say about that. Uh, if you're going to be, other than you should be, a, if you're uh, in the position of being a starter, uh, you should uh, be familiar with those hand signals and uh, ready to implement them if uh, that should be the case. Um, this slide is just kind of a reminder of the differences between rules in uh, high school and USA swimming, uh, particularly in the, the butterfly 
uh, the backstroke and the breaststroke in the butterfly and the breaststroke on the turns and the finish. You don't need to have a clear separation of hands. The hands can be placed on uh, top of each other or stacked when making the turn or the finish. That's a difference from the USA swimming rule where they have to, hands have to be uh, clearly separated. Um, in the backstroke, uh, there's uh, when the, during the turn, the swimmer can flip over and at the flags, they, when they flip over on towards the breast, they can kick or glide in into the wall after the completion of the arm pull. Um, in USA swimming, they have to initiate the turn uh, at the completion of the arm pool. Um, that, that's the difference between the, the backstroke uh, turn in high school versus USA swimming where kicking and gliding is allowed. And of course, in, in either high school or USA swimming, the swimmer cannot be uh, submerged prior to the finish. Um, freestyle, there's no differences. Um, lap counters can be used and they can be used in an ascending manner or a descending manner. And then in the individual medley, um, those during the butterfly backstroke and uh, breaststroke, those differences in the turns and, and touches apply as well during the, during the IMs. Uh, quickly on general rules, uh, swimmers will remain in their assigned lane until the uh, race is finished. A legal, a legal finish requires at the end of the prescribed distance of the race that the swimmer make contact with uh, the end wall in the manner of the stroke being swum. And we talked about the definition of the end wall earlier. Um, Host team provides the lap counters. They don't for the 500s. They don't have to be used. Um, as Pete mentioned before, during the captain's meeting or the coaches' meeting, um, if a swimmer has kinesio tape or other type of tape, uh, they need to have the, uh, documentation from a healthcare professional, and that needs to be provided to the meet referee prior to the meet so that that referee can make uh, any of the other, make the other officials aware of uh, the use of uh, tape on a competitor. And uh, medical alert or uh, religious medals do not have to be, uh, be taped to do the body, they, they can be visible. Um, next one, Dana. And there is a question in the chat for Jim. Oh, okay. uh, well, two questions. One, will you give us your expectations for qualifying this year before April 5th? And two, if we dive at a different time than swimming, do we communicate with the host directly and have coach submit the entries? All right. Uh, the first one's the, been uh, the most challenging and I think it refers, to, it does refer to uh, if there is a state championship, which has not been approved, um, they state they're going to have some sort of uh, maybe re regional or meet, and, and it may not be an issue, but if it is a state championship, um, it would be limited to 16 entries. Uh, so in swimming, that's a little easier and cut and dry based on time. In diving, uh, it's not necessarily because qualification is not necessarily based on score, uh, because scoring in different regions are are um, are going to be consistent. Uh, so it's done by a degree of difficulty, um, and uh, we usually have twenty or so qualifiers. Uh, so. We have discussed amongst the coaches if we need to determine the 16 divers prior to state, how it might be best to be sure we're uh, including the most talented, most deserving, 
and uh, and doing it on a fair basis. So yes, uh, I would hope to have it prior to the first meet, um, but April 5th is not too far from that first meet. So yeah, that'll be a goal. After um, our meeting last night, that would be uh, our primary goal to come up with a, a solution. And it could even be video judging, which kind of um, leads me, I think, um, no, this is on entries. Uh, I, I think in the regular season meets that uh, is not going to be much of an issue. The rules point to specifically, although it's helpful because whenever you run a meet, it's nice to know all the potential divers. It's easier to scratch them. Um, so uh, yes, it, it will be uh, our hopes that they enter divers uh, along with the swimmers for each meet. Uh, in the regular season, the championship meets never been an issue that I'm aware of, but uh, that's what the rule book was speaking to. So, Carl, hopefully I got some of your, uh, hopefully I answered those questions there. Okay, uh, these are rules uh, regarding the caps and suit that we're, there, uh, we're familiar with. There were no changes on these for uh, this competition year, uh, manufacturer log logo or trademark, not more than uh, two and a quarter uh, square inches uh, is allowable on the suit. And the uh, U, as we discussed earlier, the FINA or the USA swimming logo doesn't count. You can have a flag on the suit, an American flag, or I don't know, I guess you could have another flag on there as well, as long as it's not more than two by th uh, three inches. Uh, swimmers have to wear a cap that uh, is of the, the school's, uh, the school or the team's cap. If not, it needs to be blank or turned inside out. Uh, the suit material is knit, knit or woven. If you see the USA swimming check of approval or the FINA barcode on the suit, uh, that's a pretty clear indicator that the suit is uh, illegal. If it's something uh, other than that, it might be uh, questionable, but it needs to be a woven or knit textile uh, material. School logo or name can't exceed nine square inches. Um, if any of the uh, officials note uh, a suit infraction that needs to uh, be brought to the attention uh, of the coach, uh, prior to uh, the competitor uh, swimming in an event so that they can uh, fix fix the suit uh, problem or or be disqualified. And real quickly, uh, swimming officials as a starter referee pair, we're uh, pretty used to working together. And these are just some quick reminders. There's no uh, entering the water without the referee's permission. That would be either the, the whistles to, uh, you know, get up on the short whistles, the long whistles, get up on the block, enter the water during the, the backstroke and then being uh, started by the starter. Um, um, that, that's not allowed unless the referee gives permission to uh, enter the pool. Uh, if they re-enter, if a swimmer re-enters the pool after a race, they're disqualified from the next event. And then as a starter, uh, they can designate somebody to, to ring the bell or blow the horn during the 500 uh, freestyle. It doesn't have to be the starter. And I think, I think that's it on the rules, um, Dana. And I don't see any more questions or anything in the chat. So I don't either. So now I need to put the other PowerPoint back up. Oh, something just came up in the chat. Oh, that was me responding. Oh, okay. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah. Just trying to multitask and doing a poor job of it. I was going to buy you some time, but I ran out of things to say. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't draw it out any longer.
Okay, there is, a, I have a few questions, we'll type them in from. You'll have plenty of time. This section may bore you completely. <laughs> no, I doubt that. Let's see, share screen, go back to this. Five, seven. All right. All right. This is this is what we do. Um, the one uh, great thing um, since we've started uh, um, creating diving officials in and the process there is that many of the uh, host diving coaches are uh, officials, uh, particularly the ones that have diving facilities and pools where we're going to be running the meets. So um, my first bullet point kind of states that 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 host uh, of the meet is uh, usually uh, going to act as the diving official unless uh, other arrangements are made uh, prior to that. Um, and there are usually other uh, diving coaches there. Um, one of the things that might be a little different than Pete and Jeff's role and, and others here on this call is, is that diving official is usually also the diving coach. So they're uh, multitasking. Uh, they usually always have to show up ahead of time as well um, and inspect the equipment, but mostly it's that uh, the diving board, the fulcrum, if it's the host meet, he's already had that done. Um, however, another coach might do the same or another diving official just to be sure uh, it's in working order. Um, and sometimes that's not noted uh, or noticeable really until we're into the warm up session. So um, there has been some concerns, but usually there's two board options in many of the pools for the divers. And if one board doesn't suit them, the other one will, but uh, both of them need to be safe. Uh, the next point, let's see. Uh, uh, kind of the first thing we're into once we, uh, are in this pre-meet regime and then it's also a possibility um, that you're starting your warm-up so for diving officials they're doing this hopefully prior to the start of warm-up um, so they can be an active coach and put that hat on but uh, reviewing the dive sheets for accuracy uh, making sure the entries are confirmed and and putting together a diving order uh, that's presented prior to the start of the event um, it is, is done. Yeah, reviewing the dive sheets is somewhat time consuming. Um, many coaches are better than others. Sometimes they allow their divers to fill them out and their officials uh, need to be aware of that and catch any of the issues. Um, there is an opportunity to change some errors on the board, uh, but sometimes that's at the uh, expense uh, of some possible scoring for the diver, but it's done and mostly done out of safety reasons. If there was an error in putting a, a dive that's gonna be um, uh, in a position that's, that's a difficult one to do, um, we allow that to be changed, but they can't get the more difficult uh, degree of difficulty. Then uh, we, um, when we complete the sheet, uh, they add up the, if they want to be a state qualifier, the coach or contestant needs to add up the degree of difficulty that has to be verified by the diving official, uh, usually circled in initial so that we know uh, after we got to get them, particularly that dive sheet uh, needs to be submitted to the NMAA. That's our document uh, and reviewed by the NMA uh, official uh, for diving, which is me. So I usually, get them back. But um, the coach was, I have a copy, which I recommend um, uh, for verification of the qualifying standards. Uh, the other is to be sure we have an adequate warm up period, monitoring the time of that. Maybe we could start the meet um, a little earlier um, if everybody's warmed up well. Uh, put together the judging panel, the, uh, and, uh, the official uh, conducts a pre-meet pre, pre -meet, uh, 
rule and reminder meeting with the coaches and the divers. A lot of times it's just reminding them um, if there is an issue, a lot of, uh, uh, could be a, a noise or a disturbance or a distraction during the event that they have to immediately come to the diving uh, referee um, of the judging panel and not anyone else. Uh, and immediately after their dive, usually that referee is, is heard or seen the same distraction and can allow that dive to be done again if it in his um, uh, estimation that that did affect the dive. Um, so we go over those things and making sure um, they're all aware of just regular issues that could come up during a diving event. Um, once that done, uh, we go to the next section, which is the meat itself. Um, the uh, head, uh, usually the host diving coach, we can clip to the next slide if you uh, can, but the, usually the head coach will act as the referee. We're pretty blessed, although we don't have uh, strong in numbers, we do have an, uh, the head coaches we have are, are uh, very competent, skilled, been around for uh, quite a while. So no matter what pool we're at, we usually allow that head uh, host coach to be the referee. Um, I particularly like to look at it and make sure uh, we're getting um, as much telling on the judging panel as we can, and so does the, the referee. So that's usually it, unless, the, unless that's uh, uh, done differently uh, ahead of time, planned differently ahead of time. That uh, uh, referee, this is really where the rubber meets the road is the head referee being um, knowledgeable of all the rules in, in diving. Uh, what I usually try to communicate in, in all cases and particularly in championship meets is there's uh, scoring from one to 10 and, and, it, and that should be used if you're comfortable in it because there are certain mandatory deductions of points based on a scale of one to 10. Um, if you're not using um, this whole scorecard and you rarely see tens, it's a, uh, but um, it's the, the mandatory deductions. There are a number of them. Uh, determining failed dives is kind of a critical one, uh, but that's up to the head uh, referee and he consults and makes that, uh, uh, opinion prior to your ability to score it if you're the other judges on the panel. So uh, communicate the other uh, situation that might occur for the official to step in is to be sure when it's that when things are announced uh, that um, uh, if the diver doesn't hear it and, and you can see a perplexing face on the board, they usually are asking Maybe they didn't hear the announced dive and you, you make sure that that's um, communicated well to the diver um, or to the judging panel if they didn't hear um, the dive uh, that was announced prior to the competitor performing it. Um, and then the last bullet point that's, uh, that's a part of every meet, whether it's a championship meet for sure, because time is more critical many times, but in, in all meets, you have a certain run of time and even more so this year where uh, there's no overnight. So um, a long running uh, diving competition can delay them to get back to their homes, wherever they came from pretty late. So I always uh, keep an eye on the movement, uh, the pace of play, so to speak, but also it could be the announcer that you need to have a discussion with to uh, speed it up or add someone to the scores table to help uh, speed up the event. So those are, those are things that we keep an eye on as diving officials during the meet. Um, afterwards, uh, it's more administrative. Uh, you don't go back through the scoring, but sometimes there might be an issue. And so coaches are usually very helpful in in um, reviewing uh, the scoring, if it's not computerized, if it's manually done. Uh, 
signing the score sheets, particularly uh, it's a must for any of the state qualifying sheets. Um, so uh, you put together the event results, pass them out uh, and sign them and uh, get the state qualifying sheets along with the other dive sheets uh, to their respective coaches uh, before they um, head out. And the last tidbit is many times it's done the day before. So getting it to uh, the host uh, meet director or official, uh, the results of the diving events, making sure they get them as soon um, as they're tabulated that evening. So they have them to do the final scoring of the event the next day. Um, those are most of the, uh, what do we have? We have a question here. Three judge panels may be what meet get at best. I know. Oh, yeah. What well, state championships? You could go to just the number of judges can be a challenge, um, and it may be. Um, it was one that I brought up in my follow up with Jackie and Sally. Uh, if, if there are only four meets. Um, swimming coaches uh, are going to try to schedule as best they can those four meets, but it might, uh, the point that it might be smaller meets, not the invites, larger invites. Um, well, probably half of the high school swim teams have divers or maybe an active diving program. So that could be less uh, qualified uh, judges in the audience. If uh, it could be just the home team has the diving. So we're, we spoke about having consolidated diving meets. Um, you talked about it, Jeff, in how West Mesa could run two meets at one time, but you would, wouldn't be able to do it electronically. Albuquerque does this more often, where they may have uh, a couple meets going on at the same time, and everybody's diving at the same time. They sort the sheets out and do the scoring. But what that does is it consolidates more diving uh, talent and judges um, qualified judges. So uh, we're, we're touching on that. We can do three judges. Um, that's what we like to have as a minimum, but there is allowance for two. Um, and uh, we, uh, there's no posted rule, but uh, that would be suspect as far as any state qualifying if the two judges were from the same team. We like to have an, at least an impartial one in there. So those are all little uh, things we try to deal with, but we usually have three judges. You don't throw out a score, but if you have five judges, which is preferable, you'll throw out the high and low score and uh, take the three uh, scores that uh, uh, are more the norm. And I think that answers the three judge that's what you'll normally see throughout the year, but state or district championships, um, you hope to have five. And then there is a question in the chat for whoever wants to um, jump on this. I am a USA swimming official, but new to high school swimming. Are the differences Jeff pointed out the only ones? Also, are there any different expectations of officials in high school swimming? So yeah, I'll take that. Uh, so the the rules that I pointed out on those slides, those differences in the in the touches, uh, in the uh, butterfly stroke and the IM uh, during those strokes and the backstroke turn, those are the uh, only differences. Uh, between high school and USA Swimming. Um, and as far as uh, expectations, uh, no. Uh, you're, you know, the expectations of being a, a swim official are, are pretty much standard across the board in uh, USA and uh, NFHS. There's, there's no real differences there. You're, you know, like, the expectations are the same. And then um, there's another individual who said, I too am a USA swim official and new to high school swim. The rule book does not indicate the uniform. 
it indicates the state association determines this. Could you please let me know what we are expected to wear? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Speedo? Yeah. There's, <laughs> there, there, there is, uh, I know last year there was a lot of discussion about the, uh, uh, how a, a, a swimsuit should fit and uh, what it should look like and what the coverage should be. And uh, those, that same uh, coverage for a swimsuit, male and female still applies. Um, oh, for, the, for the officials. What is the officials uniform? Oh, the officials uniform. Yes. <laughs> Um, sorry, I thought you were talking about swimsuits. And, uh, and I don't think Speedos is the answer to that, but whatever you guys want to do. I mean, I'll, I'll support whatever Jim wants. Yeah, for, for high school swimming, we usually, uh, at least here in New Mexico, we're still wearing the, the tried and true white over navy blue, uh, white top over navy blue bottoms uh, with white shoes. We and then it. At the state meet, we try to give you a, a fancy shirt for the second day. So yeah, that's that's right, uh, and we usually wear those shirts uh, uh, for finals, uh, and we don't change anything on the on the bottoms. We're still navy blue, and we wear the NMAA provided shirt usually for finals. All right. It looks like all of the questions have been answered. So our next section is stroke and turn. And for that, we will turn it over to Pam Medley. Hi, everyone. Um, the rules that we have here are basically USA rules. Um, not everything is going to 100% be um, that way for high school because we don't typically run the meets with a full deck. Uh, most of our meets are going to be, you know, two to three stroke and turn, maybe four stroke and turn um, with a starter and a referee. Um, once again, we're not 100% sure that that's even going to happen because we're not sure how many meets we're going to have per day and how many officials we can come up with. So we may be running some of these decks with a very tight or very limited amount of um, officials. The referee could be doing both the starter and ref and then the stroke and turn, we could have maybe just two people as a stroke and turn. So just kind of a little bit of a highlight there. Um, so the guidelines of being um, a stroke and turn official are to know the rules and those are gonna be in um, the rule book that you guys get. Um, read and understand um, the information um, in the meet announcement and generally we try to email that information to you prior to the event. Um, attend the officials meeting and in years past um, for the ones here in Albuquerque and Rio Rancho, we've always tried to um, have the meet referee um, email the officials with what the um, start or what the uh, uh, meet time is going to be for the officials. So that's going to be up to that particular meet referee um, to let you guys know. Um, we typically don't have a sign in or an assignment sheet. Um, uh, so we're just going to kind of go through these real quick. Um, during the stroke and turn meeting, um, a lot of this stuff is going to be um, discussed by the referees so that you'll know exactly what's being covered per meet. Um, we're, unless it's a state meet, we're once again not going to have a chief judge. It's basically going to fall to the meet referee for this kind of stuff. Um, in most of our meets, we're not gonna have um, relief rotations unless it's going to be a state meet or a district meet. Um, Dana, go ahead and go to the next um, slide. Thank you. For those of you that, um, for most of the USA swimmers and most of the high schools that have done this before, you're very familiar with this. Um, this is pretty much just for officials that have never done high school officiating before. Um, so, you know, kind of have your own checklist um, 
uh, of things that you want to do before, during, and after the um, the meet. Um, know where you're going to be standing. Once again, the ref is going to tell you where that's going to be. Um, let's see, be prompt to the meetings, dress appropriately and professionally, um, be att uh, attentive during the strokes. Um, those of you that are gonna be doing the 500s, I strongly suggest that you um, keep track yourself on um, uh, how many touches so that we know if the 500 is being done complete. Uh, the starter generally keeps track of that too, but it doesn't hurt to have um, two people doing that. Um, turn off your cell phones. Um, if you need to have access to your cell phone, you know, make sure the ref knows about that prior to, um, but you definitely do not want to have um, cell phones being seen on the deck. Um, everything else is pretty much self-explanatory. Um, Dana, go ahead and let go to the next one. So, for the stroke and turns, um, since we're going to be limited on the amount of officials, you are going to need to have a two-way radio. Um, and we will be um, calling in the calls to the referees. So you want to make sure that you do a mental checklist um, before, um, visual, visualize the stroke, run through the rule, rule requirement of um, the stroke and turn, and always remember benefit of the doubt goes to the swimmer. Um, we generally have a, a heat sheet with us on the deck. So um, maintain that, that heat sheet and try not to be waving it around. Um, try to keep it kind of discreet. Um, but do write down your um, disqualifications on that heat sheet. So in case we have to go back and ask a specific question, then um, we can address that. Um, before each race, um, remain out of visual sign, uh, uh, sorry, visual line of sight of the timer so that um, the timers can see the strobe and the start. Um, stand on the long whistle. I mean, we don't typically have chairs for officials at a high school meet, so just kind of stand back out of the way. Um, let's see. So you're going to be basically, once the long whistle goes, then you're going to um, wait for the start, and then once the start goes, then you're going to step up to the edge of the pool. Um, we're not going to have people standing on the 15 meter mark for the flags because generally we don't have enough people for each meet, but that will happen at a district or a state. Uh, Dana, go ahead, go to the next. Uh, you want to develop your own mental checklist of things that you need to do before, during, and after um, each duty. Uh, so after the start, walk briskly to the edge of the pool for the breast and butterfly, if working the start end of the pool. Um, turn judges, um, when it's in your jurisdiction, you want to step up. Observe the swimmer until they depart your jurisdiction. Um, determine if all heads um, broke at the surface prior to or at the controlling 15 meter mark if um, walking the stroke. We are not going to have that. Um, give equal observation to all lanes in your jurisdiction. So those of you that are new, we typically don't cover one lane. We cover either two or up to all eight, eight lanes. Um, so be aware of that. Um, raise your hand promptly to signal that you have a possible disqualification if an, if an infraction is observed. Keep your hand raised until acknowledged by the chief judge or the referee. Um, do not discuss the infractions with another official or any other individual, including the coach. Um, before report, reporting the designated, um, reporting to the designated official. Um, so do not discuss it afterwards unless asked um, to by the deck referee. Um, immediately communicate the lane number to the chief judge, which typically is just going to be the deck ref. Um, if a turn judge is covering more than one lane or a stroke judge, um, same thing. 
visualize the infraction before communicating it to the um, deck referee. Use rule book or disqualification slips language to communicate your infraction. Next one, Dana. Develop your own mental checklist of things to do um, during and after the duty session. So um, after the start, um, watch all lanes while reporting the DQ unless relieved by a judge. We're not gonna have that unless it's a district or a state event. During relay exchanges, observe the toes departing from the platform and then look for the um, touches um, for the fingers for the swimmer that's in the water. Um, do not raise a hand for an early relay takeoff when um, dual confirmation is being used. Circle the lane and the swimmer number on the takeoff slip and a good exchange as an X for an early takeoff. Um, if there's no infraction, then basically it's a no call. Um, check to make sure DQ slips have been written and documented properly before signing it. Um, most of that is going to be done once again at a district or a state meet. And then once again, remember benefit of the doubt always goes to the swimmer. Next one. Um, after each event, we want to reset to the correct position for the stroke um, or the next event. Um, transition between heats for relief do not, um, not during, the, um, during a race. Um, we're typically not going to be doing um, rotations or anything like that during some of the smaller meets. That's going to be typically for a district or a state. And once again, the referee will explain all of that at each meet. Um, let's go ahead and go on to the next one. Uh, coordinate with the assigned partner to observe the pool and um, politically enforce compliances with warm ups. So most of that's going to go to the deck ref. Um, always uh, refer to them. Um, open pace lanes um, are designated time and racing starts as requested. Um, sometimes we'll open up uh, additional for sprint lanes if the demand warrants. Uh, we'll have to coordinate with the announcer and marshals for that. And generally that's more of a, a meet ref that would be do that kind of stuff. Um, review deck setup in general, um, notify the meet ref if there's any defi deficiencies or safety issues. Next one. Uh, consider your body language when on duty. Um, so at all times, we need to look professional. Um, and remember at districts and states, we might be on camera or if we have audiences, there's always going to be cameras around. So um, we wanna look as professional and act as professional at all times. Be alert, attentive, focused, calm, professional and approachable. Um, always be friendly and helpful to coaches, swimmers and other officials, even if they are not. Um, avoid coaching, cheering, fraternizing with coaches or swimmers. Um, questions should be directed to the appropriate official. Do not engage or in discussions regarding a disqualification. Uh, take discussions and emotional issues off the deck. Uh, do not abuse your credentials. If you are not working the meet, you are not or you are a spectator and should act as such. Um, maintain a sense of humor and on to the next one. Make sure the benefit of the doubt always goes to the swimmer. Um, ad adapt the meet coordination and needs and help out wherever requested. And once again, that's gonna come from the meet um, referee. Um, apply and use common sense. Uh, don't read more into the rule than it is written. Observe the swimmer. 
but do not scrutinize. Um, exhibit confidence. Uh, dress professionally. Um, Okay, the rest of the stuff is pretty much for state and and whatnot. So we'll just go ahead and pass on this. Dana, let's go on to the next one. That's all of them. Yay! All right, any questions um, regarding any of this? Now I know we have some officials that have never officiated high school swimming. So um, Jeff, I think we have some possible slides that we could send their way for viewing strokes and turn. Um, so we might want them to uh, email or put something in the chat so we can get that off to them. And Pam, mm -hmm. if you want anybody who needs those uh, slides, if you're brand new to high school swimming this year, uh, go ahead and send me an email and I can pass that information on to Pam and Jeff just because you all have my email address. So <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't be on this thing tonight. So does anybody have any questions for any of our presenters? Um, while you're thinking of questions, I do want to thank Pete, Jeff, Jim, and Pam for your presentations this evening. I know this was different this year because we're online instead of being all together. So uh, those of you who have been around high school swimming for a while on the officiating side of things, you all know how much I enjoy the company of our swimming and diving officials. So it's kind of a bummer that we're not all together, but uh, hopefully that'll change within the next year or so and we can all be uh, laughing in the same room and, and enjoying each other's company live instead of in little tiny boxes on my computer screen. So Again, uh, thank you to our presenters for everything. If something should come up, we have recorded this, so we'll be sending out a link um, hopefully within the next couple of days. So feel free to refer back to it should you have any questions. I'll also share the PowerPoint so that you've got that if you wanna go back and look at any of this information. But know that if you've got questions, you can send them to me and I will get them to uh, Pete, Jeff, Jim, or Pam, whoever the question is for, and we'll, we'll get that answered. Yeah, Jim, go ahead. I want to uh, thank you, Dana, for putting it together and oh, sure. also offer an invitation that if any of the swimming officials would like to, um, if, if, a lot, uh, if able, want to hang out and, and, and kind of just shadow, we need uh, as many um, people knowledgeable about the sport of diving as we can. And, and we love to share our, our knowledge. And I did say that we share, we do a couple caps, but once we get through that front end and get the sheets checked and it's warm up, that's a great time to just come over or introduce yourself if we don't know each other. And we'll kind of go over how we would score a dive, how we see a dive. Um, it's kind of interesting and we've had that happen on a couple occasions. We love it as diving coaches. So um, following Peter on the deck might be a challenge for me, but uh, if I get the opportunity, I'd love to do that too. And I was a swimmer growing up as well. So um, just love the sport and, and appreciate any of this, all the support we're getting from the swimming community too. So just wanted to pass that along. That's awesome. And for those of you who, don't know, uh, last year was actually the first year that the NMAA and NMOA started to sanction diving officials. So it was kind of a, it was a rough start because I had no idea what we were doing. So um, Jim and Pete and Joan and Pam really took the bull by the horns and Jim was wonderful and, and kind of uh, got me to where I understood it a little better. Um, and it, it's been great having the, the diving officials on board with swimming. Uh, swimming and diving is one of the newer sports within the NMOA. So we've got 10 sports that we sanction officials for and swimming is one of, one of those still kind of in its infancy as far as the NMOA goes. Um, awesome group of officials. I just, I love the relationships and I love the lightheartedness and 
uh, just everything that goes on with the, within this officiating community. So it's always fun to be with you all. And, and I'm so glad that diving is with us now as well. And uh, hopefully we'll continue to grow. And Jim, I appreciate that offer to kind of get some uh, training, some OJT as they call it. Um, and, and certainly this year is a little weird because of COVID. So it's a it's it's a strange year to come in, but we want to make sure that we take care of all of you as much as we can. And, you know, there are some amazing veteran officials in this group. Please feel free to ask them questions and they'll get you acclimated as quickly as possible. So don't don't feel free to, or don't feel afraid to reach out to everybody is here for you. So um, anything else from the presenters, Jeff, Pete, Jim, Pam? Uh Dina, this is Jeff. I just wanted to say thank you for organizing the meetings the last couple of nights. Uh, uh, really appreciate it. And, and just to reiterate what you said, uh, I'm looking at the names here in attendance on this meeting, and we have a, a good group of uh, highly uh, experienced officials, and uh, we're all accustomed to working together, uh, high school, USA Swimming. Um, so don't be afraid to, uh, if you're new to uh, high school officiating, don't reach out to any of us and we'll, uh, we'll take care of any questions you have or uh, any concerns that you might have. And yeah, I just wanted to say to Jim, to thanks for uh, all your uh, input last couple nights and uh, uh, really appreciate that. And I'm glad the diving uh, folks are on board and uh, I might take you up on that OJT. Nice. Look at that. You're recruiting, Jim. What a what a good plan. But I, you know, definitely um, you all hear me talk a lot about officiating family, and I always definitely feel that family within the swimming and diving community. So um, you know, reach out, do whatever you need to do. Nobody'll nobody will turn you away. Um, I will say from personal experience, the swimming and diving community is very patient. Um, I always have a zillion questions and they're wonderful answering those and getting me steered in the right direction. So I, I always appreciate that. So if you're a new official in the high school setting uh, or if you're new entirely to swimming and diving, which I think a couple of you might be, um, you're, you're joining a great group. So enjoy the experience and everybody, I hope you have a fantastic season. If anything changes, if anything comes down from the state, we will share that with you all as soon as we get it. So we're very much um, in the, as soon as we know, you'll know operation mode at this point. So just keep reading my 3000 emails and we'll, we'll keep you as posted as possible. So have a great night, have a great rest of your week and please feel free to reach out should you need anything. Dana, just yes. one quick one quick thing to also add from an assigner's perspective. Um, I know we're we're nowhere close to even being being able to assign any meets yet because we're still waiting for that to come down. So, just everybody out there, be patient with us. As soon as we can get this going, we will. And um, just be patient. That's all I can say. <laughs> It, and that's a great point. Everything right now um, for this year, I'm glad you brought that up, Pam. Um, the turnaround of everything is a little tighter than usual. So the, you know, our assigners do a great job, which for those of you who don't know, Pam is the central assigner, Joan Shankin is the north assigner, and Pete is the south assigner. So we've got three assigners for the support of swimming and diving. And of course, Jim handles the diving officials for everybody, I think. So we've got uh, three swimming assigners and Jim takes care of diving. And normally we have a little more time to get assignments out this year because of the, the tight turnaround, that will not be the case. What we do recommend is if there's time or dates that you know right now you're not available, please let your assigners know that. The more information and communication you can give to them, the better. Um, to the assigners, Nate will be contacting you about assignments. We had talked a little bit last year about Arbiter and putting meets in on all of that. So we'll make sure we get with you within the next week or so about how that's going to look, if Arbiter is still going to be the tool we use, or if there's something that's going to be easier for you all, especially with how weird this year is. So we'll, we'll be in touch with the three, well, the four assigners soon with Jim. So um, be on the lookout for emails. And like I said, if there's a time that you know you are absolutely not available, you'll probably want to give your assigner a heads up immediately so they can 
um, not go through the process of sign of assigning and unassigning you. So um, if there's no other questions, I think that's it for tonight. But if you think of something in the middle of, your, of the night, like I do at two o'clock in the morning, write it down and contact me tomorrow because I probably won't answer my phone at 2 a.m. So everybody have a great night and a wonderful week and a wonderful weekend ahead. And I look forward to working with you this year. Good night, everybody. Thank you. And thanks again to our presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Of Thank course. You, Dana. Thank care. you. Take Appreciate care, you. Take care, everybody. You too.